Thank you, Angela. I appreciate always her energy and enthusiasm. And uh, <clears throat> wow, it's 2019 Palm Sunday. It's been a long time since that first Palm Sunday. Uh, they weren't celebrating that Sunday on a gym, but rather outside of Jerusalem on a hillside on a, a road or a trail that descended into Jerusalem. Uh, before we get to that Sunday in my teaching this morning, I want to back up in the story quite a bit. Angela shared with you already that I'm going to be talking about some deeper truths behind Holy Week. And so let's start in the ancient past. First of all, many ancient religions had as part of their ritual, if you would, blood sacrifices to their god or gods. Ancient human beings at least had some understanding, regardless if it was twisted, of their separation from the divine being and their need to approach that being on the basis of a blood sacrifice. And I know this is not a popular topic even in today's uh, Christianity. In fact, there are some that are preaching a bloodless cross, but apparently it was a popular topic with the 40 writers that wrote the book we call the Bible because it is scattered from Genesis to Revelation, the concept of a blood sacrifice. The one true God, the creator of the universe, has revealed himself in many ways throughout human history. Part of his revelation is contained in the 66 books or letters written by about those 40 authors that I've already mentioned, writing over a period of about 1,500 years. We call their compiled writings the Bible. One of the expanding revelations in the Bible that starts as a scarlet thread beginning with the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3 in God's curse of own creation as a result of them joining a rebellion with a rebel angel named Lucifer is a universal law. When I say universal law, I know that if you're from a science background, you think of things like gravity. And, and, and I always like to compare the spiritual laws to those scientific universal laws because they're just as unchangeable. God ordained gravity. That if I, I, I've got a pen this morning, I always do this. If, if I drop this pen, it always goes one direction because of that universal law called gravity. It doesn't go sideways. It doesn't go up. It doesn't float. It goes down. And that's the law of gravity. Well, there are universal spiritual laws that are just as unchangeable as I stated and one of those laws is that there could be no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Hebrews 9 22 says that and that's just one of many passages that say that are illustrated throughout those 66 books or letters. We might not like this. I'll be honest with you. I don't understand fully why God wrote the script this way. But here's what I always like to say, and I'm saying this more and more. I think I need to say it particularly in America. This is not your universe. <laughs> it's not my universe either. As Americans, we sometimes get the idea that it is our universe. But it's not. It's God's universe, and he gets to write the rules. And that's one of his rules. And we'll develop that, and maybe we'll get a little more understanding before you leave here as to why that's one of his universal laws. God wanted us all to get a glimpse of what that word sacrifice means. So he orchestrated that scene, if you're familiar with the Bible story, on Mount Moriah, recorded in Genesis 22. If you're a student of the Bible, for the first 20 or so chapters of Genesis, things are moving rapidly. We're starting in eternity past, and it's a big cosmos, and we get just a little glimpse of creation. Then there's a man, there's a woman, and we've got all kinds of things happening. And then we get to Genesis 22, and the story slows way, way down. And a drama starts to unfold on a mountain. And it involves a potential human sacrifice, a father sacrificing his son. And that sounds horrible and gruesome, and it is. And it's clearly against God's laws. He has ordained throughout the scripture that he, he said he hates human sacrifice. He detests it. It's horrible to him. So why would God orchestrate a scene on a mountain where he's asking his chosen guy, Abraham, to sacrifice what he calls his only son, speaking prophetically, because it is an allegory of a greater sacrifice that will be made later. I think he did it for several reasons, but 
One of the reasons clearly is he wanted you and I to feel what he was going to feel 2,000 or so or more years later on another hillside outside of Jerusalem. As Abraham is about to kill his son Isaac, who doesn't have any understanding of what's about to happen to him, God intervenes. And again, continuing the allegory or the metaphor, he provides an alternative sacrifice for the boy, a ram in the bushes. But before God provides that alternative sacrifice, young Isaac asks a question recorded in Genesis 22-7 that rings down through 2,000 years of Jewish history. And it'll be answered later. Again, on a hillside outside of Jerusalem. Daddy, he says, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Skip forward a few hundred years after that scene on Mount Moriah. And a story is recorded by Moses in Exodus chapter 12. God unfolds a little more of this mystery of the sacrificial lamb. The descendants of Abraham, which are now a race, maybe of a million or more, possibly, well, certainly hundreds of thousands, they're trying to break out of the bondage of Egyptian slavery they've been in for several centuries to go with their leader, Moses, to a land that God has promised them. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, has refused to let them go, even under severe pressure through miracles provided by God. Finally, an angel is sent by God to kill the firstborn son of every household in Egypt. To avoid this incredibly awful judgment, the Israelites were instructed to kill a lamb and put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of their homes. And the blood of the lamb, God tells them, will cause the judgment of God, and it is God's judgment, to pass over, so to speak, that household. One verse from that story, Exodus 12, 13, God speaking. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Many Jews today still celebrate that event that we simply refer to, and they did too, as Passover. Then in the book of Leviticus, Moses records God's instituting this Jewish sacrificial system. And for hundreds of years, thousands of animals would be killed and their blood spread on Jewish altars to pay for the sins of the people, or at least that's what the people thought. More on that in a moment. The curse, though, the curse by God, the judgment of God on the planet, on creation that started in the Garden of Eden was still in effect. But these sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, through these sacrificing of these animals, at least got some understanding of the ugliness and the high cost of sin and moral failure and humanity's rebellion against its creator, God. Jump forward again. As the New Testament writers open up their first century historical accounts, and by the way, they profess to be writing historical accounts. They profess to have interviewed many eyewitnesses that saw these things, or they were eyewitnesses themselves, as in the case of Matthew and John. We're going to find a storyline developing in all four of these New Testament historians' writings. A storyline about two men. They're probably cousins. One is slightly older than the other, and the older one is preaching repentance and forgiveness from sin. He's a wild-looking critter. He's one of those Old Testament prophet types that took a Nazarite vow that didn't cut his hair, that doesn't drink wine, that lives out in the wilderness. His name is John, John the Baptist he's called. The other man claims to be, though, something much, much different. His name is Jesus. And in John 1.29, John records John the Baptist answering the question that Isaac had posed about 2,000 years before. You know the verse. John turns to his disciples, his boys that follow him, and he points at his cousin coming to be baptized in obedience to the Father's command. And he says, look, he tells his guys, 
the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb had come. It's not the son of Abraham. (laughs) It's not the, the son of any human being. It's not an animal. It's the son of God himself, disguised as a first century Jewish rabbi. The creator had become a man. And he's walking the Galilean countryside, teaching the values of heaven to those first century Jews and doing miracles to validate his deity until one Passover week, a time when first century Jews were still celebrating that ancient event that delivered from the judgment on Egypt centuries before by the blood of a lamb. Jesus triumphantly rides into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, the first day of the week, to occupy the temple for a few days. It's not clear, by the way, and and historians are really debating whether this takes place, this scene. No, they know it takes place on a Sunday, but the scene with the Seder meal and the arrest in the the garden we're going to talk about in just a minute, does it take place on a Tuesday night, a Wednesday night, or a Thursday night. Traditionally, it's been thought of as on a Thursday night, but regardless, it takes place right after a celebration of a Seder meal in an upper room where Jesus will literally propose marriage in a spiritual way to his guys and to you and I and institute what we still celebrate today, communion, the Eucharist, or the Lord's Supper, depending on the tradition you come from. All right, back to that hillside and Jesus marching in as king. He triumphantly rides into Jerusalem, occupies the temple for a few days, and dominates Jewish religious life. Jesus is the talk of the town in Holy Week. He's there. He's doing his thing. No one can do anything about it. But you see, those Jews were not looking for a lamb. They somehow overlooked those passages like Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. They'd somehow missed the symbolism of all those things I just described with you, at least in their fullness. They thought the Messiah would come as a king. They had no idea of two comings of a Messiah. One as a sacrificial lamb and another as a triumphant king later. So when Jesus comes to town in fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9, if we could pull that one up. Do you remember what Zechariah 9.9 says, written hundreds of years before? Oh, is this just another one of those 300 coincidences in the Old Testament that prophesy about the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus? Logic would tell me no. That's just too hard for me to believe. uh, Rejoice, Zion. Rejoice, Jewish nations. Shout, and they will. They will. They're going to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Your king is coming to you, righteous and victorious. Lowly, though, and humble, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so it is. Jesus comes into Jerusalem that way. Those Jews, though, didn't understand the lamb thing. They thought the enemy was the Romans. Certainly they were living in an occupied country. Certainly the Romans had done terrible things to the Jews and to other people. But that's who they perceived as their enemy. And I went off script last service, and I'll do it again. And some of us get confused at times, don't we? I'm tempted to to name some things, but I won't. Some of us confuse things. And we think our enemy is people from another political party. Are people from another nation on the other side of the earth? Or we think our enemy is people who don't think like us, or they're from another ethnicity, or even people from that are agnostics or atheists, or they're from another religious belief. That's not who our enemy is. That wasn't the enemy in the first century, and it's not the enemy in the 21st century. Our enemy is a spirit being. And he's organized, and he's got lots of other spirit beings with him. And their purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. You, your family, your children, all your influence, all your stuff, and to have you waste the days of your life on meaningless pursuit of stuff or pleasure or to misbelieve, deny the things I'm sharing with you this morning. That's who our enemy is, and that was the enemy in the 
first century as well. The prophets had foretold his coming. All four first century Jewish historians, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record this story I'm sharing with you. Turn with me now to Luke 19, 35 through 40, if you have a Bible, or if you want to look on your phone, or you can look on the screen. And I want us to feel what Jesus was feeling a little bit, certainly what the disciples were feeling, what the crowd was feeling on that Palm Sunday, on that glorious day when the king was presenting himself to his people. Luke, the Syrian physician, records what he got from interviewing many witnesses. They, meaning the disciples, brought it, meaning a cult, to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he rode along or as he went along, people would spread their cloaks on the ground. Matthew tells us they also cut branches of trees, palm branches, and laid them in front of Jesus as well. When he, meaning Jesus, came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples, now this is not talking about 12 people, this is talking about hundreds, maybe even thousands, because they were there for Jews from all over Europe, near Africa, I mean near, near Asia, northern Africa, they were there, the scattered Jews were to celebrate Passover. And they had heard the Messiah was coming to town, the guy that could walk on water, raise the dead, heal the sick. Create food and stop storms. He was coming to town. And they knew Zechariah 9-9. And they were out there, maybe by the thousands, screaming in loud voices. The whole crowd began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher! Rebuke your disciples. They know they're ascribing deity to him. And Jesus simply says, if they keep quiet, the rocks will scream. I want to pause now and do something out of character for a church like ours meeting in a gym. We get excited during song. We think it's okay. So this is culturally a little different. I'll be speaking, James Hawkins and I will, (laughs) Friday night at St. James. And I just got to say this. In an African-American church, I wouldn't have any hesitation about asking the crowd to respond. They would already be responding. But in our group, in a gym, sometimes it's a little harder. So I'm taunting you and asking you, Stand now and engage the king when I ask you to in worship. Let's go ahead and stand before we start singing. And we're going to sing in just a second, right after this. It's okay. And I want to invite you to join with that first century crowd, with the angels of heaven, who I believe are in the room. And let's shout now. It's okay, by the way. I had a friend tell another friend one time, it's okay to shout public affection for God in church. It is. So join me in shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One, two, three. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. All hail King Jesus. The week had begun with palm branches and Hosannas, a victory march. A parade down a mountain into Jerusalem. Then a takeover of the temple by Jesus. He threw out the money changers from the temple for the second time during his ministry. A week of powerful prophetic teaching where he would prophesy the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of time. But the winds, the fickle winds of popularity were about to change for the God-man. The Jewish religious authorities wanted no part of this would-be Messiah. And a plot is afoot to execute him. That was the scene in Jerusalem. But in another dimension, a very, very real spiritual dimension, one in which only Jesus had the full picture, another drama was unfolding. Jesus knew that he had come to die. He had known it from the beginning. 
He knew that the Jewish religious leaders would reject him and execute him. He knew that he, not Isaac, not any son of Adam, not all those Jewish animals, no one's blood but his could be sprinkled on that eternal altar in fulfillment of that universal debt that was owed. And it was weighing on him incredibly heavy on that final week of his life as a human. His blood, it says in Colossians 2, 13 and 15, would cancel the debt. And Jesus would make a public spectacle of those enemies I described earlier by defeating them at the cross. What a strange way to win a victory. What a strange way to save the world. But again, it's his script, not mine. God had written himself into the story, freeing creation from the awful curse and canceling the debt by his own death. He was the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. He wrote himself into history also to use another biblical allegory as the great lover who would lay down his life for his beloved bride to appease his own sense of justice based on passages like Romans 8, Galatians 3.22, if we can pull that one up, and others like this, we know that all of creation, it says, was groaning and travailing because in some sense creation itself, not just humanity, was a prisoner of sin or at least suffering the consequences of that failure back there in the garden. Meanwhile, the universe, including all the angels in particular, are watching the drama unfold in Jerusalem. And those celestial beings that understand at least most of those universal laws, maybe all of them, even at that time, are eagerly awaiting, although it said it's a mystery that even the angels wanted to look into, that God would become a man and become the Lamb of God and offer himself up as the sin sacrifice. They're eagerly awaiting the final payment will cancel that awful debt. Ruler of darkness and his legions of fallen angels and depraved warriors are also watching in this other dimension. They know what's at stake. The opportunity still lies before them to take out the God-man. But the thing they fear most is his blood being sprinkled on that altar. Satan had failed back there in the wilderness to deter him. And now he was trying again in a garden. Those beings know that their reign of terror and domination by fear over the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve will begin to loosen its grip if the lamb really is slain. And yet they hate him. In another sense, they want to kill him. They want to hurt him. They want to torture him. They hate all he stands for. They hate his father. And they want to hurt him in any way he can. The lamb himself is wrestling with his own humanity. As he's asking questions like, couldn't we do this redemption and salvation thing another way, God? Why does it have to be like this? He'll ask that question in his fullness hanging from the cross when he yells out, why have you forsaken me? But he's beginning to ask the why question in his humanity in the garden. And you and I ask that why question. It's a legitimate question, and we don't get a full answer, and we want this side of heaven. We don't understand why all the terrible suffering in the world today, and when we're going through a particularly hard time, or we get cancer, or our spouse leaves us, or a child slips into the terrible rebellion, or an alternative lifestyle, or something horrible happens. And we see all the abuse and the war and the racism and all the hatred in the world. And we're going, why? Why does it have to be like this? And Jesus is asking that why question even beginning in the garden. The lamb is wrestling not only with his own humanity, not only the idea of the weight of the world's sin falling on his shoulders, He's also wrestling like you and I do. And we don't recognize it at times, but he knew it. He's wrestling with those unseen forces as well that want to keep him from his destiny. The Jewish leaders, back to the world that those first century Jews could see, the Jewish leaders wanted to kill the lamb for other reasons. 
primarily jealousy and fear. Caiaphas, the high priest, speaking prophetically, although he didn't know it, and John records this in John eleven fifty. 50, he says this. He says it's better that one man should die for the people than a nation should perish. The spiritual forces of evil, the self-centered, jealous plot of the Jewish religious leaders, the fickleness of popular opinion, and the iron will and the dedication of the God-man are about to collide in an olive garden. Outside of Jerusalem, Jesus has finished that Seder meal with his boys. The betrayer, Judas, has gone to sell his master, his rabbi, for 30 pieces of silver to the Jewish leaders in betraying. He's gone to get them and lead the, the little army to arrest Jesus. Jesus has, meanwhile, walked across the Kidron Valley. It's at night, and he's praying in the garden. You know the story. Three times he goes away. The guys keep falling asleep. He sweats drops of blood, or he sweats his light drops of blood. It's not clear. He's in intense agony in that garden. The hour is late. The week has been long. And the moment that all creation had been screaming for is suddenly upon the Lamb. And I want you and I to feel the cosmic tension of the moment. That's why I keep describing it. What's happening in that olive garden on that hillside? Remember the words of Hebrews 9, 22 and 10, 4. You know what it says? It's a contradiction, those two verses are. It would appear on their face. The writer of Hebrews says it's impossible for the blood of animals to take away sin. Yet, without the shedding of blood, the Bible tells us, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And the mystery starts to unfold in Holy Week. We need to remember the eternal truth that we know now, this side of the cross. It's only Jesus' blood that can by faith, individual faith on your part, free you and I from slavery to fear to death and the devil. In the garden, we find the executioner with his knife drawn. And the lamb contemplating the awfulness of what is about to happen. We're going to cover the rest of the story next week. Let me just pause and we're going to close and say a few more comments. I began this story in a garden. And I'm going to leave you this week in another garden. One more thing before I step down. You need to decide to something this morning. I'm going to go intellectual on you just for a minute. I know that most of you are thinking, Jim, we know you. We think you're a crazy, full-blown mystic. You're right. I am. But I want to go just logical just for a minute. I'm also a very logical person, strangely enough. Do you believe like I do that what I've shared with you this morning is true? Just a question, just an application question, a very important application question. Do you believe that I've just shared historical, supernatural reality with you and not just ancient Jewish mythology? If so, it could change everything for you. It should if you really believe it. The way you think, the way you speak, what you look at, who you hang out with, how you spend your time, how you spend your money. The sand, as I always like to remind myself every time I turn that microwave on, is slipping through the hourglass as I'm speaking this morning. How you perceive and process all that's going on around you. Do you perceive it only in materialistic and in real terms, or do you do perceive it in supernatural and spiritual terms? You see, the stuff that I've shared with you this morning, the stuff we'll be sharing next week, it's either a massively complicated tale woven by four incredibly intelligent deceivers written over a period of 1,500 years, most of them writing centuries apart from each other, never knowing this tale would be composed in a book called the Bible, which I think is illogical and bizarre. Or, it's simply historical and supernatural fact. You get to decide, personally. We'll leave Jesus this week on crucifixion eve 
with the executioner. The universal debt still weighing heavy on his shoulders. And all of creation screaming, offer up the sacrifice. The innocent one must be slain. What can wash away your sins? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's stand and engage that Jesus right now in worship a second time.